Okay, good morning and welcome everyone to our first session of our three-part regulatory education series. Um, my name is Kathy Arsenault and I'm the practice consultant for the Association of New Brunswick Licensed Practical Nurses. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to explain the format of the webinar, <clears throat> excuse me, for anybody that might be new to these webinars. So throughout the webinar, your microphones will remain muted. If you do have a question or a comment, you can type it into the Q&A box located on your screen. Uh, any of your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, but you can type them in at any time. If you're having any trouble hearing me, then I'd ask if you just try to adjust your audio settings, and you can find this by hovering over the left-hand bottom corner of your screen. I also wish to advise you that the webinar is being recorded and we'll upload uh, the recording to our website. So if there's folks that weren't able to join today or you think could benefit from this presentation, uh, you can certainly direct them to our website and you can watch at a later date. Uh, so we're starting this series with some information on regulation and what does that even all mean? So over the years, there's been quite a lot of confusion about what the role of the regulatory authority is and how that differs from the role of a union or, or other associations that you might belong to, like the Canadian Nurses Association. So, and that, you know, it's not just confusing for us as New Brunswickers because I've had a lot of conversations with other regulators throughout Canada and they've all said that they experience that same kind of confusion from their members as well. So hopefully after today's um, session, you're gonna be able to sort of piece this all together and I'll be able to pro provide you with the more clear understanding of what regulation is and how we do this. So we're starting with some regulatory education as our first session because it really does provide the foundation for the other two topics that we have planned, which are entry-level competencies for LPNs and scope of practice. So all of these subjects, they're really interrelated and they all stem from regulation. And there's also a lot of different components of regulation and that's what we're going to be, you know, discussing today. So. I'm going to kind of walk you through all those components. So I wanted to start by giving you just a little bit of the history behind ANBLPN and, and regulation. So in 1965, the association was first formed and at that time it was the Association of New Brunswick Registered Nursing Assistants because that was our title at that time. Then in 1977, it became the regulatory authority for RNAs and the RNA Act was first proclaimed in 1977 as well. And then we fast forward to the year 2002. This is when we successfully had our name changed from RNA to LPN to match with most of our counterparts in Canada. And then of course the LPN Act was also proclaimed in 2002. So since the be becoming the regulatory authority back in 1977, our sole responsibility has always been protection of the public through regulation of the practical nursing profession. So ANB and ANBLPN has been granted this authority through legislation via the LPN Act. So essentially it's the law and we have to follow that law because it is in our legislation. So with the LPN Act, we regulate the profession in three different ways. So the first is through education. Um, so all practical nursing programs have to meet the educational standards of ANBLPN, and these standards reflect our practice not only provincially, but also nationally. And we do that to support labor mobility so that if you were to go anywhere else in Canada to work, um, you're going to be meeting those entry-level competencies, which means you don't have to take additional courses in order for you to work as an LPN in any, any other province in Canada. The second way that we regulate the profession is through the discipline process. So when a complaint is made, we are obligated by law to investigate that complaint in the name of public safety. So a discipline committee is in place and that committee has the authority to revoke or suspend a license if there's founding evidence of unsafe practice, or they can also dismiss a complaint if there is no evidence of unsafe practice. And finally, we also set the requirements for licensure. So I'm going to 
uh, launch out a poll question to you all just to hopefully you all get the right answer. Um, so if you just want to watch your screens for a moment. So how many practice hours are required in order to maintain licensure as an LPN? So you can cast your votes there on the screen. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Answers are still coming in. Okay, so most of you got it right. So I'll just share the results with you all. Um, so it is a thousand hours in the last five years. So 71% of you answered that correctly. So you do have to have a thousand hours in the five most recent years. Uh, and I'm going to launch a second poll to you. And so compliance with the continuing competence program is required. Is it every five years, annually, every two years, or when you are audited? So I'll give you a few moments to answer that question as well. Just a few more seconds there. I see a few more people are voting. Okay, so most of you answered that correctly as well. So participation in CCP is an annual requirement. Um, so 94% of you answered it correctly. And we'll talk more about that in some of our other sessions as well if you're, uh, you're not sure about that. So excellent. So I'm just gonna take those off the screen right now. Um, so to date, once you graduate, you pass that national exam, every year you have to have a thousand active practice hours in the most, in the five most recent years, and you do have to comply with the continuing confidence program. So these are the two mandatory requirements in order for you to maintain your licensure annually. Oops. So this that you're seeing on the screen right now is really all of the components that make up regulation. And so we're gonna talk about each of one, each one of these separately, starting from that outside circle of legislation and ending with that inside circle, which is the public. And what I want you to see is that this top circle where we have legislation, that's all encompassing. And that is what we all have to be accountable to because that is the law. And then our innermost circle, which is the public. Um, the, after this presentation, I hope that it's clear that regulatory authorities such as ANBLPN, they exist because of the public and our legislative mandate to protect them. So the public expects that health professionals are going to be providing safe, competent, ethical, and compassionate care. And therefore we as the regulatory authority are legislated with the task of ensuring that this is indeed the type of care that they will receive. And this is the same across Canada. So all regulatory authorities exist to protect the public. So we're really no different than our counterparts across the country. So we're gonna start by talking about that outside all encompassing layer, which is legislation and how that pertains to regulation. So legislation is responsible for setting those parameters of practice for all health professionals that are governed by a regulatory authority. So of course, LPNs are regulated health professionals, so we will fall into this category. Legislation also sets the practice requirements for LPN. So again, an example of that is our CCP. So CCP is not just something we thought, you know, we sat around one day and we thought, wouldn't it be fun to make everybody do this and give them some extra work? Um, we do it because it's part of our legislation that LPNs have to engage in continuous learning. And we have to have a way to show government that LPNs are indeed keeping up with their competencies in the profession as part of that self-regulating process. So there is a, a reason behind it all. 
Um, and of course, LPNs also have to follow all federal and provincial legislation in terms of their practice. So again, an example of this would be the LPN Act. So we have to be um, adhering to all the components of the LPN Act in order for us to self-regulate and be good member, you know, a member in good standing of the profession. So all LPNs are accountable to the LPN Act as well. Our next level is the LPN profession regulation. So this area of regulation really states the requirements for LPN practice. So an, an example of LPN profession regulation could be your entry level competencies or your advanced competencies for LPNs. And when we're talking about entry level competencies, which is what our next webinar is going to be focused on next week, that's what states the minimal expectations for all LPNs to meet and any new practitioners graduate with these competencies. So an example of this um, could be medication administration or perhaps subcutaneous injections. So both MedAdmin and subcutaneous injections are part of the regular PN curriculum and therefore they're an entry level competency. So everybody graduating from the PN program um, graduates with these competencies. When we're looking at the advanced competencies kind of on the flip side of that, those are interventions that LPNs may perform providing that they've received the necessary post-education and clinical mentorship to perform the activity. So these are things that are not covered in the basic PN program. So an example of this could be immunization. So currently immunization is not part of the regular PN curriculum. However, after you graduate, LPNs can take that as a post-competency. So I know Horizon Health has a module for immunization that maybe you've taken and as long as your employer supports that practice you can then engage in uh, uh, immunizations. And then we come to the regulatory authority which of course in our case is A and B LPN. So the regulatory authority is responsible by law to regulate the profession of practical nursing. Our mandate is protection of the public by ensuring that our members are providing that safe, competent, compassionate, and ethical care. The authority to regulate the profession is granted by the LPN Act. And as I said earlier, we do this by setting those education standards through discipline, ensuring our members are exemplifying professional conduct, and by setting those requirements for licensure. So essentially, we're here to promote good practice, prevent poor practice, and intervene when that practice is unacceptable. ANBLPN is governed by a board of directors and those are elected by you as the members and it's the board's responsibility to govern the association and set our strategic direction. Regulatory authorities also create those core regulatory documents that guide our practice, which of course is our standards of practice and our code of ethics. But we also create practice guidelines and policies to help guide your practice and all of those documents can be found on our website. And then that brings us to the employer. So employers certainly do play an important role in maintaining quality work environments that promote safe practice by their employees. So they are the ones that create job description, descriptions and policies and procedures that are specific to the workplace that we as LPNs have to adhere to. So this is where some of that confusion comes from because we as LPNs know that what we're permitted to do in one practice environment might look very different in another practice environment. And that's because each employer can have different policies based on the work environment that you're at. Um, and this is also where we hear, we hear a lot from our members saying, well, why does ANBLPN keep increasing our scope of practice? But in actuality, your scope has not changed in several years. Uh, many of the interventions that you're performing today are new to your workplace, but not your scope of practice. So in the past, there were many workplace policies that were stopping LPNs from working to their full scope of practice. Now we're in a position where we're seeing many of those restrictions being lifted that are allowing you to work to full scope. So we really haven't increased your scope. It's just that those employer limitations have been lifted recently. 
And then next we have your LPN practice. So all LPNs have to remain um, responsible and accountable to the public. Um, your regulatory authority, uh, your colleagues, your employer, and most importantly, you want to remain responsible to yourself. So as an LPN, we have three core responsibilities. So the first is your registration, which of course open today, if any of you uh, are checking your email and things, today is the first day of registration for your 2021 licensure. Um, so it is your personal responsibility to ensure you maintain those required practice hours, which we said was 1,005 years. You comply with that CCP program annually and that you register on time. So every year, every year you have to ensure that you've registered by November 30th by completing your form online as well as submitting your payment. The second area you're responsible for is your own level of competence. So we as LPNs have to accept full responsibility for our own practice. So if any of you were part of my leadership sessions that we did in the spring, um, well, a year ago before COVID, of course, um, we were often saying my practice is my responsibility, not my nurse manager's responsibility. It's my responsibility. So main, we have to have a responsibility to maintain our own competence and our skills as per our scope of practice. And of course, we're going to be talking a lot about scope of practice in our third session on September 29th. And then your third area of responsibility is your conduct. So all LPNs have to ensure that they are governing themselves in accordance with our standards of practice and our code of ethics. Because if it's found that an LPN's practice has fallen below those established standards, it can be seen as professional misconduct. And professional misconduct is viewed as when somebody maybe has a lack of knowledge, skill, or judgment. Um, and of course, we have a formal process in place for assessing that professional misconduct if a complaint does come in. And then lastly, but most importantly, we have the public. Um, so as we discussed, it's the public that are at the core of that regulatory framework and the public is why these regulatory authorities exist. So we're mandated to lead and regulate the profession to ensure safe and competent practice by our members. So as you can see, there's, there is a lot of different components of regulation and it's, it's important that we as LPNs understand what our responsibilities are and what our accountabilities are as licensed professionals. So it can be a little bit of a complex process and I hope that you'll see that um, the regulatory authority doesn't uh, exist just to make you have to do certain things every year. We exist so that we can help guide excellence in our profession. We exist to help grow the profession, help guide your practice, and ensure that we can keep that privilege of self-regulation. And being a self-regulated professional is definitely a privilege that we as LPNs don't want to lose. So I wanted to start wrapping up today with just pointing out some of the overarching differences between the role of a regulatory body and the role of a union, because this is certainly where we have the, the largest amount of confusion amongst our membership. Um, so I want to chat a little bit about the roles of each. So we'll start on the left here with ANBLPN and, and what our, our role is. So as we said, um, we set those education and registration requirements. So we accredit schools that provide the practical nursing education and we ensure that their curriculum meets our standards. And for registration, it's a thousand practice hours and CCP compliance. We also set and enforce professional conduct of our members through things like our code of ethics, our standards of practice, and these are what help ensure safe practice from membership. If we do receive a complaint about an LPN's practice, then we are obligated to investigate that complaint to verify if any professional misconduct has occurred and to help keep the public safe from harm. We also ensure that our members are complying with regulation requirements. Um, so of course that's gonna be registering on time, maintaining your competence, um, all those functions that we just talked about. We also enforce our CCP requirements because that is part of our legislation. 
We maintain a database of all LPNs in New Brunswick with the registration status of whether you're active, you're inactive, or perhaps you have a suspended license. And of course, we do that to protect the public from those who may be trying to practice without a license, which has happened in the past, unfortunately. Um, and we protect LPNs for providing you with your medical malpractice insurance, um, providing practice guidelines and professional standards to, to support our members' practice and in the name of public safety. So now when we look to the role of the union on the right-hand side of your screen, we see the following roles and responsibilities. So the union is the one that takes part in negotiating employment conditions, and this includes the improvement of wages, uh, benefits, your working conditions, and job security. They also assist with any labor issues and help process any grievances. They seek to uh, eliminate all forms of discrimination and harassment and ensure fair representation of all employees within their union. Uh, they provide opportunities for professional development. So unions can have a, provide educational monies for any continuous learning opportunities that you might be interested in, not the regulatory authorities. Um, and they also aim to promote and protect the health and safety of their employees. Um, and so that's kind of a quick little breakdown of some of the differences, but this is where most of our confusion comes from. So I know just in the past week, I've had people call saying, oh, well, I see that the Nurses Association gave them masks and are you going to make masks for us? Um, but again, that was not the Nurses Association that did that. That was the Nurses Union that provided those masks. And I know I see that the Nurses Association has TV commercials. How come you don't have TV commercials for us? Again, that's that's the union creating those commercials, it's not the Nurses Association. So we are no different than the Nurses Association. So I want to thank you all for joining me today and I hope that that, you know, quickly helped maybe connect some of those dots of the components of regulation um, and maybe clear up some of the confusion you might have had about it and that it lays a little bit of the foundation for our next two topics that we're going to be talking about. Um, if you have any questions or comments, then I do encourage you to type them into that Q&A box now. Um, or of course, you can always contact me by phone or by email. And of course, my contact information is up there on the screen. Um, so what I'll do now is, uh, again, just thank you for joining me and thank you for all the hard work that you've been doing during COVID. Um, I know you've had a lot of policies and procedures to keep up on and, and things are changing constantly amidst this pandemic. So we certainly want to thank you for all your dedication out there as well. Uh, but I'll stop the recording now so that our Q&A is not recorded. And if there's any questions or comments, um, I'm happy to answer them in the chat box. And if you're not sticking around for the Q&A, then you're certainly welcome to just uh, lead the meeting.